I hope that this uh, last slightly less than an hour of the program is going to give you some really great ideas on how to actually get this stuff into your classrooms and engage your students with it. That's the purpose of this last hour. It's supposed to introduce to you some of the lesson plan materials that are both on your uh, DVD in your package and also will be on the conference website. Uh, we always invite the teachers who attend our programs to go back, think about it, create their own lesson plans and then share them with the rest of our community online and if you'd like to do that you can uh, always submit a lesson plan to us in a Word document and uh, just do it through email. Uh, we will go through and put it on our website and uh, index it appropriately so that all of your fellow teachers, even those who aren't here but only have the benefit of this virtually, uh, can have the benefit of your thinking with your lesson plans. So without spending more time on that, uh, let me introduce this man standing next to me. Bill Grower started his career at the Boeing Company in 1979 uh, as a co-op student working in the wind tunnel. And uh, cut to the chase, Bill Grower runs the wind tunnel at Boeing, which is one of the largest wind tunnels in the country. Uh, we've asked Bill here to specifically help us understand aerodynamics and understand it in a way in which, with any luck, we don't have to use even a single mathematical equation. And that's because, as Stephen Hawking said in the introduction to the most unread book ever published, A Brief History of Time, every time you add an equation, you reduce your, your potential readership by 50%. <laughs> it's certainly true of high school students. <laughs> and so this is time to get a little hands-on with the subject. And so I welcome Bill Grower. Thank you. Yeah, Well, thank you. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm here today is that when we are hiring students, now these are uh, college students, we find, especially today, that they do not have a good practical knowledge of, actually of our products, of how they fly. So that, could, that really needs to start in the middle school and high school um, time frame of their education. So I'm asking you to please uh, talk to the students, get them interested, get them energized, get them thinking about it. And if you plant that seed, it germinates well. We'll have a couple of people to enter the workforce that'll, that'll be prepared to do what we do. Now my job is, uh, actually I tell everybody, I have, the, I have the best job in the Boeing company because they pay me to play with model airplanes every day. And so I test, I test airplanes, helicopters, all kinds of things in a wind tunnel. Most of them are models, some are full scale. But it's a very hands-on um, type of job. It's a sort of what you call R&D. It's testing. And it's, it's a very pragmatic type of engineering. And um, a friend of mine at Lehigh University told, was commiserating with me about students coming out of uh, college that they don't have a lot of practical experience. And the way he puts it is, most of them don't know which end of the screwdriver to hit with the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're gonna, uh, what I'm really going to do here today is go through very quickly uh, a very, very rudimentary look at how helicopters fly. Now, most of us learned this. Uh, actually, I'm hoping I still learn it one day. But um, most of us learned it by first studying airplanes and then studying helicopters. And, so I'm going to take you very, very quickly through it. But I think, having talked to a lot of students from uh, the first and second grades through the, uh, through the K through 12s, I've done a lot of talking with um, college students. I've even given presentations like this to corporate executives. What I find is um, get them out of their seats, get them hands on, get them some practical knowledge, get their hands doing something. because at least show them which end of the screwdriver works. So we'll get them up. And I'm going to have a couple of you come up and help me with a couple of things. We're going to learn a little bit about basic aerodynamics here. But uh, we're going to keep this all focused on helicopters. So um, I've laid out a basic lesson plan. It's very rudimentary, but I encourage you to use it as an idea generator and then take it back. You know your students. You know what works well with them, what doesn't, uh, to get them stimulated, get them excited, get them motivated. But where I'm going to go with you today is 
a quick difference between airplanes and helicopters, and it may not be so obvious, why rotors are so important, because that's really what makes helicopters do what they can do. We're going to then talk about the story of lift and how is lift created and generated. For, especially for those of you who haven't studied a lot of aerodynamics, we'll go through that pretty quickly and, and make you an expert on that. Uh, talk a little bit about helicopter control, because helicopters are really complicated mechanical machines and have lots of systems, and controlling them is real special. We'll talk about the forces acting on a helicopter. For those physics teachers out there, we'll show a couple vectors, but that's about as technical as we'll get. Uh, I promise you no equations. And uh, I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for some fun demonstrations you can do with students in the classroom to illustrate a lot of what I'm talking about here. So, um, <laughs> so I heard somebody saying earlier, a previous speaker said, helicopters are so beautiful. I'm standing out in the hallway going, oh man, this slide's going to go over good. Um, there's a couple sayings that aerodynamicists use. Helicopters are so ugly, they, they don't fly, you know, the earth just repels them. Or uh, helicopters don't really fly, they just beat the air into submission. We also say that um, the airplane is the aeronautical engineer's answer to flight. The helicopter is the mechanical engineer's answer to flight. And so it, it, it's really sort of a brute, uh, helicopters in some ways are a brute force way of making an, something, whatever it is, a machine fly. So we tend to say, talk about these two kind of aircraft in my business, fixed wing aircraft and rotary wing aircraft. Now, for the, in general sense, everything that flies has wings. Just about everything that flies has wings. You know, birds and insects, airplanes. A helicopter has wings also. It's, it just has rotating wings. We call them the rotors. And that's the business end of the helicopter, really. That's where the power goes. That's where the thrust comes from. That's what makes it go up and down, back and forth, forward and back. The rotors are really, really important. It's the rotors that make the helicopter really special. And so all different kinds of helicopters, whether a helicopter like this, which we call a main rotor tail rotor helicopter, or uh, the, the tandem rotor helicopters, the ones with the two big uh, rotors on them instead, they're, they're all rotary wing aircraft because the wings are rotating. So the helicopter rotor, this is you know, it's a really important point. And uh, I understand there's at least a couple of uh, history students or history professors in here. And um, they, I, you know, a little bit of research shows us that the, the word rotor actually uh, comes from a, rot a rotator wing. In, in very early times, they were called rotator wings. Because a, what a helicopter rotor really is, it, it's just like an airplane wing. It's just spinning around and around and around and around. So it's a rotator wing. And you can see that rotator wing is pretty hard to say, um, so it got shortened to rotor. Now, the root of the word rotator is rota, the Latin word for wheel. And you can begin to see how some history and um, language is playing into, into this science and technology. Now, does anybody know out here, what is the most successful invention in, human in the human race? Success, successful being defined as the invention that has remained unchanged and accomplishing its original principle for the longest period of time. Anybody take a guess? The what? Wheel. 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 The wheel. Great guesses. Great guesses. That's the second most. By the way, the first most is the, is the stone knife, the flint knife. But the wheel is the second, and that's a good one because the wheel has been around a long time, and the wheel has a lot to do with our rotors. In fact, our rotors are named after the wheel. Wheels evolved pretty quickly into spoked wheels, and it wasn't too big of a leap to get from a spoked wheel to a boat propeller. It rotates. In fact, if you've ever, if you've ever been next to a spoked wheel when it's spinning, you can feel some air moving through it, especially if it's built with flat spokes. It didn't take too long for the engineers of the day to figure out that you could make a propeller, and it's a lot like a wheel. So our rotors really have their 
early roots back in the, in the wheel. It, and of course, the leap from boat propeller to airplane propeller is even easier. Where it, it's the same idea, it's just running in a different medium. Instead of water, it's running in air, so it's a little bit longer and thinner. And then it's actually a shorter jump to get from an airplane propeller to a helicopter rotor. But I see the helicopter rotor's roots being way back with the wheel. One of the most successful inventions in our history. Now, the rotor generates all the lift on the helicopter. And that's what makes it fly. And I find that most people, especially students, and a lot of teachers don't really understand how that works. In fact, they don't really understand how a wing generates lift. And everybody knows it probably has something to do with air going over it and all that. So here's a little story. It's a story about lift. And it goes like this. School lets out at 3 o'clock. Two kids are going to leave, leave school, brother and sister. Their names are Dan and Laura. They have to be home by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, uh, Laura has a couple errands to run after school. She's going to first, she's going to stop and get something to eat after school. And then she has to return some books to the library. Along the way, she's going to stop and talk to her friends a little bit, as kids like to. And she'll finally get home. Dan, on the other hand, doesn't have anything to do after school, so he's going to go straight home. So who has to go faster? Laura, very good. Laura. Laura has to go faster because she has a longer path to travel in the same amount of time. And that's the way an airfoil creates lift. The air goes over the top of the airfoil faster than it goes over the bottom. And you can see the same, the, the similar shape there. It's a longer path, has to go a little bit faster. Bernoulli's principle. Everybody remembers Bernoulli's principle, right? You physics guys? Air goes faster, the pressure drops. So there's lower pressure on the top of the wing than the bottom of the wing. If there's lower pressure on the top of the wing than the bottom wing, it, there's, you get lift. You get a resultant force going up. In fact, what most people don't actually realize is that wings get sucked up into the air. Airplanes get sucked up into the air because there's low pressure on the top of the wings, and it just, they just get drawn up. As one kid put it to me one day, lift sucks. <laughs> so as the air goes over, goes a little faster, lower pressure, Bernoulli's principle, and the wing goes up. It generates lift. And that's how rotor, helicopter rotors work. Helicopter rotor has an airfoil shape very similar to what we see right there. And there's, these days, there's thousands of different airfoil shapes, but they all do the same thing. They all make the air go a little bit faster over one side than the other and get the difference in pressure and, and the, the uh, lift is generated. So we're going to take a, 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 now we're going to take a pretty, pretty fast run forward here. Uh, so we've got this wing that's rotating and uh, it's going round and round and round. And as it goes around, it lifts the helicopter up and then the helicopter starts flying forward. Now, as it starts to fly forward, a couple of things start to happen. This is where a helicopter gets a lot more complicated than an airplane. As it flies forward, we have one of the rotors is swinging forward, and the, airplane, the uh, helicopter is flying forward. The other rotor is uh, uh, swinging aft. And by the way, if you want a good way to illustrate this to your students, I like a paper plate, something you can make at home, folks. It's arts and crafts time. Put the rotors on there, got a pencil through it, and here's our helicopter rotor. Now, as this rotor is turning, the helicopter is also moving. And oops, as our helicopter is moving, one of these, this blade, as the helicopter is moving forward, this blade not only has its, its own forward speed, it also has the forward speed of the helicopter. We call that the advancing blade. And that's got a lot of speed on it because it's got its own rotational speed plus the speed of the helicopter moving forward. So it's got like lots of extra speed or double speed there. We call it the advancing blade. This blade, however, this is the retreating blade because it's rotating. And as it retreats, 
it's going, back, it's going that way, the helicopter's going this way, so now that the speed subtract, and it has like half the speed. This, this blade has a lot, a lot of speed, this blade has a little bit of speed. The more speed, the more lift, so you get a lot of lift here, a little bit of lift there, and what happens is the helicopter rotor disc turns like this. It tilts. We call it flapping. The blades flap. Now, remember that this blade, the advancing blade, quickly becomes the retreating blade, and the retreating blade quickly becomes the advancing blade. It may take a while to think this through, but this is the way it works. Anyway, the uh, rotor disc, the disc that's described by the blades, tilts. And as it tilts, uh, the blade, if, if the blades have to move, and there's a hinge at the root of the blade. It's right here, and it's called a flapping hinge. Now, let's, just lets the blade do this. Just lets the blade go up and down. As it goes around, it lets the blade go up and down. Simple. It's a, it's a very simple hinge. It's a simple clevis hinge on most helicopters. That flapping is what allows a helicopter to fly, and that was the critical technical breakthrough that finally allowed helicopter and autogyro flight. And that, although it seems trivial to us today, it was a, it was a, a, a significant uh, technological leap. For any of you who are law uh, students or are interested in law, that hinge, this hinge, this flapping hinge, was patented by a na man named Harold Pitcairn from uh, Bryn Athen uh, in uh, Huntington Valley up in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. That is the longest, oldest patent dispute in the history of the United States Patent Office. And um, it was just recently settled about uh, six years ago. It was a, the patent was originally filed and it was actually granted, <coughs> but there were disputes and infringements and Harold Pitcairn's grandchildren finally won the award from the United States government for the infringement of that hinge because you, what really happened was the United States Army started using it, uh, private industry started using it, and all the helicopters were being built. And uh, nobody was giving him the royalties, his, his heirs the royalties on that. That was the largest patent award ever uh, in, for infringement in the history of the United States government. And the uh, family uh, finally told the government, it's so much money, you don't have to give it to us. We just want to acknowledge because it was in the billions of dollars. Interesting little piece of history. The, uh, so that flapping hinge is really what was the techni technical breakthrough that let helicopters fly. Very, very important. Because this rotor disc is going to tilt, it's going to wobble. Uh, actually, it's going to, the, 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 the disc tilts and wobbles as it goes around, and we need to keep good control of that so we can make the uh, helicopter fly and do what we want it to do. So here are the forces acting on a helicopter. And again, um, no equations, but these are the forces that actually act on anything that flies. And they need to be in balance for things to fly. For instance, the lift has to be equal to the weight, and the helicopter will hover. If the lift is slightly greater than the weight, the helicopter will go up. If it's less, it goes down. Make sense? Propulsive force. That's what makes a helicopter go forward. It has to overcome the drag. And anything that moves through the air has drag. So as long as the propulsive force is greater than the drag, it'll fly. The, uh, there's one other uh, thing going on here. It's called torque. And that is the reaction force from the spinning of the rotor. And that is, uh, that is a, a, a counteracted by either a tail rotor or another rotor located somewhere on the helicopter. Now, um, let's see. We're going to have a couple of demonstrations now that I would encourage you to do with your students to get them uh, to understand a couple of these simple principles we've just talked about. So uh, I need a volunteer. I'm a volunteer, come up, come on, come on. Whoops. We're going to talk about drag real quick. And there's lots of ways to illustrate drag, but none better than the tennis racket. So, tennis player, mm. how's your forehand? Okay, good. No, mine either. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here you go. Now, take a couple real hard swings with that. Don't hit anybody. Go ahead. Let's see your forehand. 
Oh, that's not bad. One more. One more. Go ahead. Okay, you got to feel. That's a nice racket. It's a lightweight racket. Okay, these rackets have holes in them for a reason because you can swing it real fast. If you increase the area or the wind resistance, you increase the drag. Now swing. Feel the difference? You feel the difference? That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Nice breeze, Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Thanks. Great way to illustrate drag, aerodynamic drag. Simple, easy, and you let a lot of people do it. Nothing like feeling drag instead of just hearing about it. Ah, thrust. Everybody knows this trick. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Oh, very good. And whose law is that? Newton. Newton, which one? Three. Very good. Very good. So, any state police in here? No, good. Okay, we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> so, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. This is a great illustration of thrust of Newton's law. This is what makes things go. Kids love doing it. I love doing it. It's fun. <laughs> but um, a good illustration. Talk about that. So what's the action? Uh, the action is the air coming out of the balloon. What's the reaction? Balloon zooming across the room. Action, reaction, Newton's law. That's the propulsive force I was just talking about. I was talking earlier about our, uh, our rotor disc here. Great way to show the rotor disc. In fact, you can spend an awful lot of time talking about helicopter control and aerodynamics with the paper plate and pencil rotor disc. Uh, oh, this is one of my favorites. So, you know, I wor I've worked with a lot of helicopter pilots. Uh, we try and improve the aircraft for them. And a lot of them have told me uh, the hardest part of flying a helicopter is hovering. Flying forward's easy, relatively. Hovering is very hard because you're balancing the helicopter on this column of air. And it's like balancing a ball on top of a ball. Another volunteer, please. Oh, there you go. Here we go. This is a great one. Have your students try and balance a ball. Put, what's, what works good is put your hands on the side. Try and balance a ball on a ball. Ready? Oh, there you go. He's a helicopter pilot. That's what it takes to hover. Not easy, is it? Good. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> Send me your resume. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make one up. <laughs> one of the things that makes this easier for your students is, yeah, take a little bit of air out of the ball. I have to, I, I have to admit to you, I was getting these together at home. I was trying it at home. I figured I, I better be able to do this. I got somebody else. I couldn't do it. I got, oh, that's too much air in this ball. I got to let some air out. Also, these rubber playground balls works real good. I had a student once, a fifth grade uh, student, a uh, young, young lady. Uh, the balls were pretty well blown up. She was able to, to do it with one hand, and she walked around the room, balancing both balls, looking around, talking to people. Thought, I told her, you, I know what your career ought to be. You ought to be a helicopter pilot. And lastly, this is my, fav this is my favorite. It only has uh, something loosely to do with um, uh, uh, helicopters. It has a lot to do with hovering. But it's magic. And there is nothing to get students more engaged in science than magic. And I love magic, uh, especially when it has a lot of physics. You could actually write a master's level uh, paper on aerodynamics on this one. And so I found this thing laying around the house. I'm not sure what it's for. <laughs> Maybe somebody can explain it to me later. Where's Bob Banks? Maybe Bob Banks could explain it to me. Uh, another volunteer, please. Another volunteer. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up. Come on up. This, this is my favorite. This is the hovering. Can you hold that, please? Just, just hold it like that. I don't know what it's for either. <laughs> I use it to dry paint. Okay, just hold it real steady. There we go. Magic. Uh, the hovering ball. Now, here's the great part. Move around a little bit. Just walk. They'll follow you. They'll follow you around. This has a lot, this has an awful lot to do with lift and drag. Um, if anybody wants to hear the very in-depth explanation, I can share it with you later. But it's a lot of fun. I find the students love it. Actually, it's, it's fun, isn't it? 
I think I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Here. Take a little off the sides. Okay. So I'm out of time. Any questions? Excellent. Any questions? Yes. What does the equivalent in a helicopter of the angle of attack in a fixed plane be? What is it? It is blade angle. So as <laughs> yes, that's how, what makes a helicopter go up and down. We can actually change the angle of the blades. It's, uh, it, it allows the blades to bite into the air more, or it actually allows the blades to create more lift. Urge your students to stick their hand out the window of the car or the school bus. You know, they'll get in trouble. I know, they'll get in trouble. Who cares? <laughs> you know, kids don't learn enough these days. Stick their hand out the window. Yeah. Stick the hand out the window and do this. You know, play Superman with it, or change the blade angle, pretend, it, pretend it's a wing, pretend it's a helicopter rotor. Change the blade angle, and you'll feel the lift. Simple as that. We used to call it playing Superman. Can students visit your wind tunnel site with a class or eat for the small groups? Uh, that's, that is uh, very limited, very difficult. At times, it's possible. It, we test a lot of proprietary things that we can't, we can't let a lot of people in. Oh, <laughs> let me take the next hour to explain that. <laughs> the story of lift I told you is the one that most people can easily understand. The real truth here is that lift is, lift is created by a difference in pressure. And there's lower pressure on top of the wing than the bottom of the wing. That's for sure. The way that really happens is, is that when the wing moves through the air, or the air moves over the wing, it doesn't matter. The air molecules on the top of the wing get stretched apart. And the air molecules in the bottom of the wing don't. And if you think about air molecules that are, get compressed, when you compress air molecules, you squeeze them together. So, and that increases the pressure. When you decrease the pressure, you stretch them apart. So actually, what really creates lift is that negative pressure on the top but it's because the air molecules are getting pulled apart. The distance between them is increasing as it goes over the top of the wing. And that is the correct physics explanation for lift. It's just usually a little bit beyond um, the first, first time aerodynamics lesson. But it is all about the distance between the molecules. As the distance between the molecules increases, the pressure drops. As the pressure drops, you get a uh, different pressure top and bottom. You get a, what we call a delta P, or difference in pressure. Acro you multiply that across the area of the wing, and that is the resultant force, which is lift, that makes it move. So when you increase the angle of attack of a wing, the air going across the top of it is getting stretched apart more? That's correct. Only to a certain limit. And then you get into flow separation, or which is called wing stall, and then it stops. And actually, the flow reverses. The flow from the bottom of the wing starts sneaking up onto the top. But that's a whole other lesson that's beyond where we're, at, where we're at. Is there one single person in all this historical evidence that is credited with actually coming up with the shape of a wing that, although they didn't get to fly, obviously, that proved that princi his principle? And, oh, that's a good question. And the, the answer is uh, no, not really. It, it was the combination of many different efforts of uh, investigating. There, there were people um, uh, like uh, an uh, engineer named Glauert in Germany who was probably credited with some of the very earliest airfoil research. And uh, still, some of his airfoils still remain today as being really good. Uh, the, a lot of it occurs in nature. And a lot of it was borrowed and modified and, and taken from, from all of that. It's a real good question. Nobody is. However, I will tell you that the, as far as wind tunnels go, the Wright brothers are really acknowledged as having built the first wind tunnel. And I've got to get off the stage, but I'll tell you one quick story about that. The reason they built a wind tunnel is the Wright brothers had built models of their aircraft to test. And this is sort of what I do for a living. And you know, they, were, um, they were in the bicycle business, so they would mount their models on the handlebars of their bicycle, and they'd go down a hill. And the reason they go down a hill is you could go real fast, you didn't have to pedal, and they could watch. 
and they could watch what was going on. And they would make an adjustment to, the, to this little model, and they could go down the hill again. And they had it sort of on the end of a pole on a little gimbal, and it could do this kind of thing as they're running down the hill. So the air goes over it, they're making it fly, it's controlled. It's actually a really smart idea. Well, and they were pretty young at the time. Well, one day, actually, Wilbur is going down the hill very fast, watching the model. And he's watching the model, not watching where he's going, hits a tree, breaks his arm. And, they, and you know, the two of them are saying, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> and the big technological leap that they made, which was huge, which seems trivial to us today, is you can get the same information if you hold the airplane still and blow the air over it, instead of holding the air still and moving the airplane through it. Thank you to the Wright brothers for my career. It helps pay my mortgage. <laughs>
but I start with a hands-on game to get them going there. Uh, they love games, and they don't mind playing around with things. Uh, if you bring home a new computer game or if you bring home a computer, you know, your little kids will just jump right on it, uh, even if they do break it. But they, you know, they don't have any fear of it the way we might. Oh, it's a new technology. I kind of liked what I had before. Uh, do I really have to? Uh, oh, that new iPhone, the buttons are so tiny. And, yeah, I'll go get a jitterbug, you know, so I can't go like this. Okay, failure is an important option. So, uh, here are three suggestions for types of lessons. One, problem-solving lessons. And again, uh, the, in, in its strictest nature, these are more suited towards science-type problems. If we apply what we've learned about helicopters today, certainly you could take any given segment of the history of the helicopter and show a problem to the student and ask students to think about how they could solve the problem, you know, with their own small model rather than you know, actually building helicopters. Um, in, in terms of history, there are all kinds of problems that you can create as well. Okay, talk about an actual historical event and ask what needed to be, what needs to come up to solve this kind of problem. But the notion of problem solving, getting students to brainstorm, getting students to think, um, you know, and I'll come back to this when we talk about uses for helicopters. That's another, another way you can get students to brainstorm. Think about how could, you know, rotor aircraft be? How can we apply this to other problems that are not being used yet? Biographical narratives. Oh, I'll come back to them in a minute. Um, I want to also emphasize what an innovation can be and what it can't be, okay? It has to be desirable to someone or else why bother to, why bother to come up with it, right? If no one really can use it. It has to be, it has to have a value. You've heard this repeatedly said today. It has to be valuable to someone to be bothered to, to, to apply it. And finally, there has to be a te technology that's possible. If you get these three things together, you can do something. I'll give you a good example. The, the Panama Canal. Remember the Panama Canal? Do you remember the French experience in Panama during our Gilded Age? Panama in French, I believe, if you just say the word Panama, it pretty much means failure. I mean, it's like a definition of failure. Well, what the French tried to do is, first of all, they didn't bother to try to actually lift the boats up with locks and then drop them back down. It tried to just cut it straight across like they were building the uh, Suez Canal in, in the desert. Okay, that was their first big problem. And even though a Frenchman, de Lepinay, did come up with the proper idea for doing it, they laughed at him and said, forget it. So they went with uh, Ferdinand de Lissop's idea and created the largest failure to, in history up to that time of a corporation. Uh, just about brought down the French government. Um, but really, what was the French's biggest problem is there was still no cure for malaria or yellow fever. They didn't know what caused it. We had the Spanish-American War to come along to teach us that we better do something about malaria and yellow fever before we would build a Panama Canal. And, and we learned from it, just as we learned to not have contaminated food. And we, you know, we got the Meat Inspection Act during the building of the Panama Canal. But the Bucyrus shovel hadn't been invented yet. We needed the technology to dig it out. Okay, so you really have to have these things coming together. And you'll see, you know, with, with the helicopter history, if you've seen today, there was a need for helicopters sooner than we had helicopters. But a lot of ideas had to come together yet. And they, you had to put all these ingredients together. You heard earlier talk about how helicopters were possible for certain projects, but they were too expensive. You know, again, it, it had to be valuable. And of course, Innovations can be incremental, radical, or a completely new system. When the helicopter is first introduced, it's, it's uh, a completely new system, new innovation, as opposed to uh, tinkering with a part or uh, trying a new system within it. <coughs> so let's go back to a second point here. Whether you're a history student, a science student, interesting biographies can always get students' attentions. Okay? They're fascinating stories of successes and failures. Um, heroes, misfits, famous, local people, national people, people from other countries. There's the possibility for research and interviewing. Uh, you know, just today, for a lot of us, it, it, it was very, very valuable just to meet uh, Igor Sikorsky and to meet Fred Piasecki. And they had touched history through their parents and we kind of had that feeling we've also touched history by having talked to them as well. Uh, and, and it's this whole sense of, 
of biography and how important it can be. Um, so I, I found this on Google Images. Uh, it listed Frank Piasecki, hero, and for what he's done and for what he accomplished. And I went back and looked for an old time magazine. <laughs> and his first flight, which you have a photo of already. So I think today's lessons could inspire us for various biographies that could be done. And then we had another, a third suggestion I'd given you after games and biographies was lists. And Lawrence will come back to this in the closing. Um, it could be the top 25 innovations of all time, the top 10 in a student's life, top 10 innovations or top 20 innovations in the 20th century obsolete innovations in skills, innovations in, in farming, in weapon systems, in flight, in, in whatever you want. And, and lists are, I mean, not everybody's a list person. I know some of, I'm certainly my top 10 this, you know, definitely Letterman style. Some of you may be a little less into lists, but students for the most part really like doing this. Okay, well, what's more important? Is the wheel more important than fire, you know? Is this more important than that? Is uh, the computer more important? Than When you're doing lists and you're constructing a list, it's not really right or wrong. There may be some things that, that seem a little bit off, but generally speaking, we're not talking about right or wrong, okay? The student has to defend what they come up with, defend their perspective, defend their thinking. How did that become so important? If you, want, if you were doing flight, what are the top 10 or 15 innovations of all time in flight? Well, certainly there's no right answer to that. There's going to, you know, one will make the argument, well, this, this thing saved this many lives. And this, this, this application of, of, uh, of aeronautics saved this many people. So I'll go with that, you know, and so forth. But students get to think and reason. And as Lawrence had said earlier, we want you to put in your own two cents on this. Send in suggestions for other lessons and ideas. If you go to fpri.org, to our education area and then innovation, you will see I have about 10 lessons posted there that, that are mine, and there's another bunch of lessons we've been posting. Please, take any lesson you like. Cut my name off it. Put your name on it. Change it any way you like. Make it adaptable to whatever grade or students you're teaching. Go with it. <laughs> this, unfortunately, is the problem we face when we're trying to get people to to teach innovation. And that will conclude the PowerPoint. Are there any questions about the PowerPoint or any of the content right there? Yes. Are those lesson plans on, uh, yeah. are they on the disk that we picked some up today? Some of them are on the disk, plus some other lessons are on the disk that I'll be talking about in one moment. So you have lessons on the disk, you have lessons on the website. Again. They're yours. Just take them, use them. How do you get to the website? FPRI.org. And, uh, and then there you'll see there's an education. Click on that. And then within that, innovation. And then there's that. And we have other lessons posted there as well, history lessons and, you know, under, under Walkman Center. OK. I was also asked today to speak about applications of the use of helicopters in general. And, you know, in brainstorming this over the last few weeks. You know, we heard today a lot about military applications, troop transport, um, a little, not too much about unmanned spying, just the, the implications we'd be doing more of it, but obviously we're already doing plenty of it. Monitoring, military surveillance, mine sweeping, I don't think that came up today yet. Anti-tank and assault missions, evacuation, protection. I mean, these have all been military applications, and you could get students, if you were teaching ROTC, you could get students to brainstorm additional military applications. I have to tell you, last year, I was at Big Sur, California, on vacation, and if you don't know that, it was huge fires down there, and we yeah. were prevented from going down to San Luis Obispo uh, because roads were cut off for the fire department to get into the hills. And Chinook helicopters coming in with huge, I can only describe it as a bucket, yeah. right into the ocean picking up that Scoop water, we were right there in the parking lot, probably 50 feet away from that operation. Uh, my girlfriend and I watching them go over the hill, drop the water and come back. And I you know, show that picture in class. And it's just an amazing thing for them to see how this stuff really works. I, I saw the same operation at Big Sur over a decade ago in a different fire. 
I mean, it's, uh, as you know, California, it's, it's pretty much an epidemic now. But, uh, but yeah, it is fascinating to watch. Fascinating to watch. Um, but for civilian uses, and we could begin with firefighting, obviously, medical evacuation, and that is becoming more and more common, if not more and more expensive. Uh, rescue missions on sea and land. I think one made the news a lot last week because uh, they landed in a rugged section out west. Was it in Nevada or Utah? You know, and I had to make a landing on a little tiny butte where obviously a plane couldn't land. Nobody else could get in there, but helicopter got right in. Uh, crop dusting, uh, police surveillance, oil rig servicing, sightseeing, uh, public transport, corporate flights, construction, um, traffic reporting. Uh, again, you could, you could get students to brainstorm to find out more applications for this. And, you know, it's not, when, I, when I've taught U.S. history and when I've consulted at various schools around the country, it's not unusual for the first time for the helicopter to appear in any book or any lesson to be the Vietnam War. Okay, the fact that helicopters were around in World War II it is barely mentioned, if at all, in, in most texts. Uh, so pretty much the entire history of, uh, of helicopters prior to the Vietnam War is ignored. Um, and, you know, and, and students have enough trouble with, with, with details, but certainly if they, if they aren't even exposed to anything, you know, how are they going to know? How about rescue from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon? How about a use of a helicopter for that? Well, and that's that, usually from Vietnam War, you see, you know, an Apocalypse Now style photo, you know, coming in with napalm or the rescue in 1975 as we're evacuating the, right, the Saigon, exactly. Yes? Paul, do you think students would be more creative or would think more outside the box if you said something like this to them? The aircraft scientists tell us that with a fixed wing aircraft, we'd like to design it differently so that the wing moves faster than the aircraft. How would you do that? <laughs> and let them puzzle on that, because if you look at a fixed wing aircraft, it's yeah. impossible. Right. But they have to think outside the box and think creatively, which yeah. it seems to me is the whole point and, of the and endeavor. Again, it would be fun, and, and occasionally I'd, I'd have a chance to do this. Uh, uh, my, my colleague there, uh, Jerry Dorland, who teaches physics, and I was teaching AP history, there were places where you could create a problem like that and then apply it to an historical setting, you know, and kind of do both things. And, of course, you get, you also, I, I also read AP exams. I've been doing that for years for uh, the College Board and ETS. And uh, I remember an answer I had not too long ago about the use of nuclear bombs, and they talked about little boy and fart man. But the more, <laughs> I don't even get to read funny things about helicopters because they, you know, they, they don't even know enough about helicopters to get it wrong. I mean, they just don't know anything. So it, it really is, it really is a, an area that needs to be explored more. Um, on the, uh, on the discs, on the DVDs that you have, which include hundreds of slides, including the 285 slides that you, you recently saw some in fast motion, uh, as well as the movies, as well as the entire 360-page book that you got a preview of uh, this morning, uh, there are also lessons on there as well. And one of the lessons has to do with vocations involving um, rotary aircraft. And here I give some suggestions for guidance counselors. I don't know if there are any here, but you could share this with them. And then as for teachers as well. Um, there are just lots of fields that overlap this technology, but people don't even think about it at all. Um, and then for the lessons that are involved and the skills that are involved in those things, there's all kinds of applications to different classrooms. So for example, you'll on, on the thing here, everything from aircraft communication systems, aircraft guidance systems, oxygen equipment, steering controls, uh, flight computer systems. There's going to be a need for jobs in all of those areas, and all of those involve a range of training, uh, skills, operation monitoring, operation control, critical thinking skills, judgment and decision making, active listening, um, Transportation, public safety, and security knowledge, geography. I have a section in that lesson for teachers about how you could use GIS and how you could use Google Earth for teaching more about geography. If someone wants to design an airport, or if Philadelphia, God forbid, puts another runway in so that planes could actually land there within an hour, uh, where, would you, where would you design this to be? Um, uh, I've, I've 
found a lot of fascinating cases where people have not figured out how to deal with, with aircraft and landings. Obviously, helicopters would be a whole lot easier. Uh, I remember landing in the Galapagos on the second and what turned out to be the final try. The runway was only so long, the plane needed a few extra feet, and they had a mountain of dirt at the end. So without helicopters there, they simply had to do the best they could. They kind of skid off the end of the runway, and the wing barely touched the pile of dirt. And that's how we got off the plane. Yes? I just wanted to say for the first, he brought up something that, that was, piqued my thought here. The, for the first time in our history, I don't need the microphone, it's okay. Uh, yeah, but we do. They, uh, <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the first time in our history in the Air Force, we're now training UAV pilots that are not pilots. The Air Force is anal about officers being pilots. We have been since we broke away from the Army back in 1947. And for the first time, this class, this year, okay, will be training non-traditional pilots to fly unmanned aerial vehicles, a joystick from thousands of miles away. And who are the heroes? These young high school kids that grew up on this stuff. They walk into that training, they've got the coordination, they've got the eye-hand coordination, they, they're playing a game all their life, and now it's real. And we're gonna have great, we're gonna have great, great success with that and enlisted and, and people, as well as officers, being able to fly this unbelievable equipment, you know, from scratch, not much older than my high school students. So that's innovation. Um, one final thought here. Again, for those of you teaching at the high school level, things like AP courses, it was, oh, I guess it's been 15, 20 years now since on the AP European exam, they had a document-based essay question entirely on World War I aircraft. Um, and, and they still do stuff like that occasionally. Another year it might be the Flemish and the Walloons. But, you know, but, but my point here is you get a student who shows an interest in this kind of thing, and even if your curriculum appears to be highly fixed or rigid, there's no reason why they can't go on an excursion for their own research or their own document collection on, on rotary aircraft, its history, its involvement, what, what kinds of turning points took place because of it, or in a more contemporary field, if you're looking at the, at the war in Afghanistan and the war, the, the, well, I shouldn't call it the war in terror anymore, it's been renamed, hasn't it? But the, the ongoing conflict and, uh, and what is the role of helicopters in, or for, for that matter, how did we get all the Stinger missiles out of that theater because we're there, they don't seem to be shooting down our helicopters, so we somehow got them back from the Mujahideen, right? Uh, but there are all kinds of current problems that can be pursued that are related to, to rotary aircraft as well. Uh, any final questions? I've used up more than 10 minutes. I think we passed 15. Am I okay? Yes? Is that AP history question on World War I aircraft available to the public? Can I get that somehow? What would you remember what it was about? Um, I didn't even teach the course then at all. Uh, they have a website. Yeah, the college, well, the, the College Board website will only go back about eight years. It'll give you the last eight years. This is an old DBQ. Um, God, it, it might be from the early 80s. I think it's probably from the early 1980s. Um, you could contact them and, and ask if the, the question's around. But then again, now in this Google age, you just might find it posted somewhere just by searching World War I aircraft, advanced placement European history, and you might find, because I found a lot of other DBQs I was looking for that way. But uh, yeah, it's, anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Our uh, next speaker is somebody who uh, I've gotten to know in my, the course of my association with the museum. He is the person who gave me my first in-depth tour through the museum, and I suppose mo many of you have had a taste of just how deep his knowledge is of this facility. Uh, Bob is uh, a senior manager at Boeing, and uh, seems to eat, sleep, and breathe helicopters uh, more, than, more so than anyone else I've ever met. And please give a warm welcome to our chairman here, Bob Beggs. Thank you. All right. I know I'm standing between you and getting out of here. So we're going to do this quickly. And it's I think we're going to have a bit of fun. How many of you, I suspect many, have climbed, as you've climbed into a uh, commercial airplane on your way to 
someplace and got to sneak a look into the cockpit and looked at that maze of who knows what instruments and stuff and wondered, how do they figure all that out, <laughs> right? What is this? So in 10 minutes, I'm going to demystify cockpits for you, okay? When you get out of here, you could look into any one of these helicopters out there or most airplanes and it's going to make perfect sense to you because they're all fundamentally the same, all right? But I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help. So I'm going to be asking folks to come up. And since we want to move this along, I want volunteers to just step up. So I want somebody who thinks they have the right stuff. Now, if you're already a pilot, I don't want you up here. But if you're willing to learn, I need somebody to step up who's willing to be a pilot. Have you ever flown an aircraft? I wouldn't say really. No Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he did. <laughs> he thinks he did. Excuse me. But he's alive to tell about it. So. All right. So I think uh, part of this is to help give you some ideas for how you can take complex subjects and kind of make it fun to learn. Now, this is a, looks like a sophisticated little <laughs> jig here. You can do this with a couple of blocks of wood and, um, and some sticks. But uh, unfortunately, I actually could you just stand up a second. I got to put this. All right. If you, you can sit back down now. All right. You're, well, you're welcome to take pictures. You're welcome to stand up and look. Here's our pilot, right? Well, he's not a pilot yet because he really doesn't know how to fly. But we're going to teach him how to fly a helicopter. All right. So Bill told you all about the rotor disc, right? So the things that the pilot first has to deal with are the things in his hand there. Now, think three things when you're a pilot. There's three things you have to do. Aviate, navigate, and communicate in that order. Aviate, just like when you're driving down the road, paying attention to the road, making sure you don't go off the road, that's aviating, that's flying, that's driving. Navigate, right? Get to where you're going. You gotta pay attention, right hand turn, left hand turn. You have a GPS, that helps. Communicates last, right? So, like, talking on the phone doesn't go ahead of aviate, right? <laughs> or driving your car. But same in airplanes, aviate, navigate, communicate. So what are your three primary missions? Aviate, navigate, communicate. Excellent. OK. The primary controls in your cockpit to aviate or to control the airplane is your cyclic. All right? So that's this control. In a helicopter, when you move the cyclic forward, that rotor disc through a series of mechanical linkages essentially tilts forward, allows the helicopter to go forward. Pretty straightforward, right? When you pull back, the disc goes back and you go backwards. And if you go to the left or the right, yeah, it goes just like that. So your cyclic gives you that kind of control. Control over there is your collective. Now somebody asked about changing the pitch of the blades. When, you, when the pilot pulls up on the collective, the pitch of the blades, those rotor blades change and they bite into the air more. So when you pull up, the pitch changes, bites into more air, the helicopter goes up. When you push down, the helicopter goes down. All right? Got that so far? What's this called? Cyclic. What's that called? I have no idea. Collective? Collective. When it goes up, what happens? Helicopter. When it goes down? Helicopter goes down. Outstanding. <laughs> you only have one more set of things to worry about, your pedals. <laughs> All right? So. If you think of a regular helicopter, you know that little tail rotor in the back that's counteracting the torque, right? You heard about that. You saw that in a lot of pictures. Well, these pedals control that tail rotor, all right? So when you push on the pedal, it's going to change the pitch of those blades and cause the tail to yaw left or right, right? So when the, helicopter's fl when the pilot is flying, he's using his pedals to control the yaw of the aircraft. He's using his cyclic to go forward and backside, and he's using his collective to go up and down. Right? So in coordinated a hover, he's balancing all those things. So it's kind of like Bill talked about balancing a ball. Helicopter pilots are very busy keeping all those forces balanced. But it's pretty straightforward, right? What do the pedals do? They control the yaw. Yep. What does that collective do? Brings the airplane up and down. Yep. And what does the cyclic do? Outstanding. He's well on his way to being a pilot. Okay, so in front of every pilot, right, there's an instrument panel. So we're going to create a human instrument panel. 
All right? Now, you, instrument panels are all the same. No matter where in the world you go, you sit in the airplane or the helicopter, and there's a bunch of instruments that are completely the same. So we're going to talk through those. And I'm going to invite some folks up. Who's got good attitude in here? Who's like really got good attitude? <laughs> Somebody happy, like always happy about things, good attitude? You look like you have good attitude. Come on up. All right, you're going to stand right here. In fact, could somebody give me a chair for her? I'm going to use this chair. Because you're going to be here a while. What are you trying to say? No, actually, <laughs> I'm going to put this chair here for somebody else. You're going to stand behind this chair, but you can lean on it. Okay. And you're going to hold this because you have good attitude. This is an attitude indicator, all right? And she's got good attitude. So this is, this is telling him what the attitude of the aircraft is whether it's tilting left or tilting right. So if he can't see out the window, and he's flying on instruments, he just looks at this, and it tells him how the, air, the attitude of the aircraft. That's right, now if he did that, you got it. All right, so what are you? Attitude. You're an attitude indicator, all right, you got attitude, excellent. That's the first of a couple of critical instruments. The second, all right. <laughs> it looks like a clock. What's that? It looks like a clock. It's not a clock, though. Who is, I'd say, I was thinking, who gets high? But I don't want, <laughs> I, I don't, I didn't want, I didn't want to quite go. Who's fast? Who's, who's like a runner? Who's like fast? Who does everything fast? Somebody get up who does things fast. Oh, you're fast. Okay, you're going to stand right next to her, okay. right? Yep. And you're called airspeed. Okay. You know how you talked about the, the helicopter going through the air? We kind of have to know how fast we're going, right? The airspeed indicator tells us that, right? So let's see if he's got it. What's this? The airspeed indicator. What's that? The attitude. What are you? Airspeed. What are you? Attitude. All right. So we know how fast we're going, but we got to know something. You know, we can't be sitting on the ground. We've got to know how high we are, right? <laughs> All right. Anybody? He's real high, right? Here. <laughs> I, I have a better idea for him. Okay. <laughs> Who was a child of the 60s? No. All right. I just, I need somebody to come on up. I, I need somebody to come up who likes to get high. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's a scary thing that he took that. All right. So there's altitude. That's his altitude indicator. And the altitude indicator tells me it's actually... It's actually based on barometric pressure, pressure, but it tells me how high I am, all right? And I'm not going to go into the details between, uh, but think of it as airspeed, attitude, altitude, all right? You got that? Mm -hmm. All right. The fourth thing that a pilot needs to know is where he's going, right? Which direction he's headed, right? So although aircraft have compasses and things like that. Most aircraft have a horizontal situation indicator. Horizontal meaning where I am over the ground, right? Kind of which direction I'm going. So who's got kind of good directional skills? Knows where they're going all the time? Come on, yeah, I, I could see it just by looking at you. <laughs> so you're gonna sit down, you're gonna sit down and hold that, all right. So this is considered, in every aircraft, this is considered the basic T, all right? If you went and looked in the cockpits of those aircraft or you climbed into, you know, that commercial airplane and looked in, you would see these four instruments like that consistently. So every pilot gets in, knows to scan. What are you? Airspeed. Attitude. Altitude. Horizontal indicator. Horizontal situation. Where, which way I'm going over the ground. Now, there's the basics. With that, you can fly just a bunny. If you've got a little Piper Cub, that's all you need. But there's a few more. There's just a few more. <laughs> so, something that's really important is that engine, right? You know, to fly, you really need to kind of know the health of the engine uh, and your gearbox and things like that. So we have an engine control panel, an engine indicator. So these are 
things associated with your engine, the gearbox, temperatures, how much fuel you have. It's just a set of instruments, can look a lot of different ways. Who likes, who likes engines in here? Anybody like engines, tinkering with engines and stuff? Yeah, you? Yeah. No. <laughs> come on, somebody come up here. Come on. You gotta make engine sounds. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right? <laughs> so you're gonna kneel down, you're gonna kneel down next to him there. Right. And so let's hear an engine sound. That's a good sound. That's a good sound. I like that. So, yeah, outstanding. So, you, you are basically telling him that everything's okay, right? It's okay. We're flying great. Everybody's, yeah, good. Shiny side up. All right. We talked about aviating and we talked about navigating. Now we have to communicate. In an, in an aircraft, you communicate not by yelling out the window. Well, in the days of Frank Piasecki and, and Igor Sikorsky, they did probably holler and shout a bit. But we use radios nowadays. Who likes to chat on cell phones? Yeah, oh yeah, come on up. <laughs> you're going to stand on that side, and you're going to hold our radio panel. Right on that side. That'll be perfect. So, you are all the radio control. So pilots communicate. They communicate with the, the tower. They communicate with the ground. They communicate with folks in the back. And they use the quadrant of radios and intercommunication systems that, are, that are, uh, allow pilots to communicate. And they generally talk through headsets and a microphone. And they just control all the frequencies right through there. So before we go, we only have one more. So this is getting easy, right? <laughs> what are we? Speed. Airspeed. Attitude. Altitude. Horizontal uh, Make a noise. <laughs> Engine. Chatter. Chatter. Talk. Go ahead. Say something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. A man. But that's good. When you're flying, you don't want to tie up the airwaves with a lot of chatter. So we should get somebody quiet. Now, one more important, one more important piece of information is in the off event that something isn't going well, the <laughs> designers have created a panel. Uh, and generally, there's a light that's associated with it. It's a master caution panel. And it has, and it has a lot of little lights. <laughs> Just like in your car, you know, the idiot light that turns on, when, or your engine light that turns on? Well, there's a lot of those lights. And see how they're kind of blurry? That's because when something's going wrong, <laughs> things are shaking. So we purposely made this blurry. But, I need somebody who's kind of loud, loud and annoying. Anybody in the room considered <laughs> loud and other than me, loud and annoying? Come on, this, Come is, on. You. this is you. I was waiting for you. Right. That's right. right. This one was for you. Why don't you just stand right over below, right kneel down under him? Your job, if something's going wrong, right? Your job is to go, ah, ah. That's a master caution warning, right? <laughs> okay, so, so make an engine sound. Keep. Now, if he stops, what are you going to do? Ah. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> and what are you going to do? Oh shoot. oh, shoot. That's right. <laughs> All right, so we have this, this, you know that very complicated cockpit you saw? That's what's in there. Now, in a, in, a, in a military aircraft, there's some special mission equipment and things like that. But in general, if you go out in any of those aircraft, you're going to see these instruments basically set up this way. You could fly an aircraft. All right, so we're going to ask him one more time to go through everything that's in his hands and on here. Go. What's that? Uh, cyclic. Cyclic. What's that? Collective. What's that do? It makes the helicopter go up. When that goes up, what would you expect that to do? Yeah, you'd see that start moving, right? <laughs> and once you're up in the air, right, and you push forward on your cyclic, what do you think would happen here? It'd probably go up. Yeah, it would start going up because your speed would start increasing, right? That's your airspeed. Yeah. And what, if you started to turn, what would that one do? Look at her. She got good attitude. <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you got an engine problem, what would happen? Ah. Uh. <laughs> well done. All right. So, so what, what was, to most people, a fairly complex thing has been simplified to the very basics. And this is exactly what pilots look at when they fly. Now, one more thing. One more thing. Just hang for a minute. 
technology changes, right? Technology changes, and although all cockpits in most aircraft that you would see look exactly like this in this configuration, um, what designers do in cockpits now is they take all this stuff and they put it on to a TV set, to a multifunction display in the cockpit. But if you look at this, this is the display that sits in front of a pilot. So if you look in that cockpit of the airplane, you look in, you see they have two TVs in front of them. That's what's on there. Airspeed, attitude, altitude, horizontal situation. The standard T pattern. Exactly the same, just on a TV screen instead. All right? Does that make sense? Yes. How'd our pilot do? Is he good? <laughs> All right, I'm going to, I will award him since he, uh, since he is now a certified pilot. Here you go. You are approved. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. You guys were a perfect instrument panel. Well, it's amazing. But we're just about to finish on time, and I have to thank all of our speakers for helping us do that. We started the day by asking the question, why is just invention not good enough? And the answer to that was that you need invention, perceived need and value, and that becomes innovation. And we can engage students with innovation in, I think you've seen, dozens of styles with virtual cockpits, with history, with, biology, with, with biography, with the technology. When you walk out on the floor here, you can look at the artifacts on the floor as a piece of history. You can look at them for the amazing engineering value you can look at them for what they did to the way people thought and behaved, to the difference in the way people fought wars or saved lives, and your students can place this technology in its place in 20th century and now 21st century history, politics, and policy. And we hope that that's what you've gotten from today and from the materials that we've put together and that we'll continue to put out on the conference website, which is fpri.org slash education slash innovation. Now, the one thing I need to ask you to do is to promise me that you'll go back to students and find some little way to use this material because it will engage them. These are, as we said at the beginning, just plain cool machines. Have a safe trip home.